I'm Jacob Walker, and today I'm going to be talking about data-driven visual forecasting. So consider this image in front of us. Traditionally, researchers in computer vision have thought about trying to get uh, understanding an image from very specific paradigms. One such paradigm is the object-oriented or semantic aspect of an image, where we might try to classify and identify objects in the scene and apply human-chosen labels to them, perhaps even detect objects in the scene, or even describe with a sentence what is going on in that image. There is also the spatial or geometric aspect of an image. Things like depth perception, surface normals, or the 3D configurations of objects in the scene. However, we as humans can perceive more than just that in an image. We know that an image is sort of a window to a world that is also temporal. We can tell, for instance, in this image, that the boxer is probably going to punch the punching bag, and the punching bag is probably going to fall towards the boxer in the next instant. So how? And why would we be interested in getting computer systems to have this capability as well? Why would this be important? Why would we, why would we care about this? Well, there are a few direct applications of visual forecasting. The first is sort of the idea of getting ro robots and computers to interact with the world in real time. For, for, for computers to understand the world as it happens, they need to identify actions not only you know, after they've occurred, but perhaps even as they occur or even before they occur. For instance, we'd like to know, we'd like computers to understand that this man really would like that coffee. Another practical application is self-driving cars. We don't want cars to run over other people or other cars. For instance, what is the probability that this person is going to cross the street. And more generally, if we think not only about robots, but computers in general, interacting with their environment, it would be useful for high-level tasks like planning and decision-making to understand the consequences of your actions. If I'm a robot and I'm moving objects around, if I'm a car and I apply acceleration, if I'm just an agent in the visual world, how do my actions affect the future state of that visual world? And how can that help with decision making? And finally, I have to note that forecasting builds on top of other basic ideas in visual perception. In order to forecast what's going on in this scene, we also need to identify first, what are the active elements in the scene, sort of an implicit active object detection. In addition to that, we then, based on con the context of what's going on, we need to understand how things are going to move over time based on what's going on. So implicitly, we need to understand that this is a boxing scene. So we could also argue that forecasting is also applicable to representation learning, especially in its data-driven form. If we're able to get computer systems to forecast the future frames in a video, then we can implicitly learn a representation that might be useful for other vision tasks. And finally, that sort of goes to my, my point, is that visual forecasting is a fundamental or integral part of what it means to understand a scene. So where do we start? How do we even begin to tackle this problem, especially in a data-driven way? Well, in this talk, I'm going to talk about some of the approaches I, I use at Carnegie Mellon and explored. The first basic part being sort of forecasting motion in an image, forecasting optical flow in a single image. I then build upon this idea with motion prediction in images to pixel trajectories. So not just forecasting where pixels move over the next instant, but forecasting where pixels are going to move over multiple frames, like 30 frames over one second, understanding sort of in a data-driven way where groups of things are going to move into form. And so this is so motion, pure, pure pixel motion, but 
can we build a to on top of those things as well because just pure pixel motion is not the full story. That doesn't model the things like the occlusions of objects or the appearance of new objects or the change in the geometric pose of an object. So ideally, we'd like to think about forecasting in sort of a state space representation where the image is in a particular state and we want to forecast the future states of the image. Now, it's hard to do that with pixels alone, but we could use some type of intermediate representations. So I also move into discussing ideas like the use of mid-level patches as a mid-level or intermediate representation for forecasting, as well as the use of human pose. So, in a nutshell, I'm first going to talk about approaches to motion, just pure pixel motion prediction. I'm then going to move into the ideas of using sort of intermediate representations for forecasting. And then after that, I'm going to touch upon some possible future directions that could build on top of this work. So first, a quick segue into related work. So there's a lot of related ideas out there. Uh, we're not sort of the first people to attack the idea of forecasting. There's also the, the idea of domain-dependent forecasting, where people have thought about predicting events in very specific contexts, like pedestrian trajectories, as well as trying to do things like detect or classify action classes as they occur or before they occur in video. There's also been some initial approaches to motion prediction, which we later used as baselines. Things like a nearest neighbor approach or, or structured random forests to predict motion in images. This is also sort of related to generative models of video. So people have taken ideas such as generative adversarial networks, variational autoencoders, pixel CNNs, and apply them not only to generating images, but also generating video. So now on to the first step. How do we tackle this problem? And we're going to start with something very simple and basic. Consider an image like this. So we as humans, we can identify there's a motorcycle in this scene. This is some type of dirt racetrack. However, we also know that this, this object is probably going to move towards the right in the next instant. So how can we train a computer model to do this? How can we get computers to understand this? this very basic thing. And the initial idea people might have is we should just do regression over optical flow. So we can get tons of labels using an optical flow algorithm from lots of unlabeled video. And then we could just simply try regression, some type of regressor, whether that's implemented through a normal convolutional neural network or some other machine learning uh, tool of your choice. However, this is actually not going to help. Because if we have a single image, there's actually going to be a level of ambiguity in our forecasting. For instance, take this image of a person doing a pull-up. Now we know we can easily identify, OK, this person's going to pull up. But we can't really tell specifically whether he's going to move up or down. We, have sort of a pro we, have an, we can sort of think of a probability distribution in our heads. OK, half of the time he might move up, half of the time he might move down. We know he's not going to fly off the image plane, he's not going to do some type of side motion. So the probability distribution has a level of information. It's not completely random motion, but it's not completely deterministic as well. But the problem is that if we try to train a regressor with this type of data, then in, with, with ambiguity, just raw deterministic regression is going to tend to zero. Because if you have something that moves up half the time and down half the time, the optimal solution for a regressor is going to be zero. So how can we get not a deterministic output, but some type of probabilistic output? And the approach is fairly simple. What we're going to do is we're going to pose our regression problem as a classification problem by, doing, by basically discretizing the output space, the continuous output space of optical flow, into clusters. And then we're just going to turn it into a classification problem. So at every pixel location, we're going to try to do pixel classification. In this case, though, instead of trying to classify like what the object is at that region, we want to classify what the optical flow cluster is in that region. And we're not necessarily concerned about classification accuracy 
as much as we're concerned about getting a good, informative, underlying probability distribution over the discrete optical flow clusters. And so I also want to emphasize that these clusters, they don't only represent magnitude, but they also represent direction. So we have different clusters at different magnitudes and directions. And the overall pipeline is just very similar to semantic segmentation. We're just changing our classes from objects to optical flow clusters. So how do we train this? We take training data from the UCF 101 data set, so basically sort of messy YouTube videos that have been clipped. We're going to self-label them using an optical flow algorithm, which in our case was deep flow. And I'm going to show you initially some qualitative results. So these particular results are just, they're, they're basically just um, specific images where the network was very confident of a particular motion. And we're just sort of demonstrating here that based on this simple task, just trying to forecast optical flow in a static image, it is able to sort of understand um, not only what objects are supposed to move specifically in that image, but you know, how it's supposed to move based on the context. So in this case, we have someone playing a guitar, and there's a high confidence that they're going to move their, their arm up towards um, northwest or northeast or upper right. We have a horse, and here, I mean, obviously the horse is going to move to the right. We have someone here pulling an arrow or pulling a, a bow and arrow back with their arm. They're going to move up their hand. We have someone here walking with their dog. Both objects are going to move to the left. So what we're demonstrating here is that different parts of the body might move at different times based on what's going on. I also emphasize that it's not just simply slapping on motion based on the scene. It actually will use pose cues to change the output within the same scene and the same person. So this is just a static frame prediction. And here's another one. This is just static frame. I'm just demonstrating here that it's taking in all types of contextual cues to forecast the motion. So based on this simple idea, you're able to get a, 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 a model to, to understand image context as well. So how do we quantitatively evaluate this? Because just using endpoint error isn't going to be very helpful for the reasons I described before, because there's an ambiguity. So we evaluate this in the following way. At every pixel, there's going to be a distribution over optical flow motions. And then we're going to rank them according to probability. And then we're going to look at a ground truth optical flow within that, pix within that location and look at how that ranks under the probability distribution and report how often the ground truth came within maybe the top five or top 10. And by this way, we're able to really see a difference between our approach using a CNN and just some baseline approaches based on things like nearest neighbor or structured random forests. So we did this on the UCF1 as well as the HMDB. And so that's nice. We can forecast for motion for in a single instant. But how could we predict further in time? What, uh, what about understanding not only how this object is going to move in the next instant, but where it's going to be, say, in the next second? Where, how is it going to move over the next second? Where is it going to be? How can we get that in a data-driven way? And that leads me to sort of the second step, predicting pixel trajectories. So we can sort of think of this as a generalization of optical flow. Instead of tracking a pixel over the next frame, we're going to track pixels over 30 frames. So understanding sort of a path of pixels through space time. And we can have obtain these through improved dense trajectories. So this is, we can use basically a framework that was used originally for action recognition and apply it to this to track pixels. So we can get these labels in a self-supervised way. But again, if we just simply try to train a regressor on this problem, we're going to tend to zero because there's going to be implicit ambiguity in terms of how things might move, even in a simple scene like this of someone writing the board. And our classification as regression trick isn't going to be so helpful here because the output space is going to be far higher. So instead of a single linear vector at each pixel, you might have like a 60 vector at each pixel, describing a complex path over space-time of where a pixel might move. So 
how are we going to approach this? How can we sort of estimate a probability distribution in this high dimensional continuous output space? And the idea here is that we're going to apply uh, a t an idea, uh, basically a variational autoencoder to estimate the conditional probability distribution per image. And what we can do is, using this variational autoencoder, we can sort of sample latent variables. And based on what we sample, we can implicitly sample the different futures or different ways the outcome of an image can go. So based on what we can sample, this person could move their arm to the right, or they can move their arm, say, to the left. So it's just a, a quick overview of what variational autoencoders are. They're basically, this, they're, they're, they're an autoencoder. What you're trying to do on a high level is you take, an in, you take input data, you encode it into latent variables, and then based on those latent variables, you reconstruct them. But the twist here is that these latent variables are going to be stochastic. On average, we're going to model them as standard normal, and they're going to be sort of noisy. And what, what's going on here is basically what we want is when we sample from our latent variables, we're basically trying to implicitly sample from the distribution of our input data. So another way to think of this is you have a series of landed variables um, that are normal. You're going to feed them through a decoder, a neural network decoder that's going to warp and twist this random variable into a distribution which hopefully matches the distribution of your input data. So applied to that, what we're basically doing here is that we're going to apply a variational autoencoder to autoencode motion trajectories. And then we're going to have our latent variables encode the motion trajectories. And we're going to condition everything on an image. So we're not trying to apply a variational autoencoder to generate images, which is sort of what they are initially applied to do. We're actually going to do something different. We're going to use them to generate trajectories conditioned on an image we already have. So just as of a diagram, we just have a, a very, just a variation autoencoder. And we're just going to plug in an image tower as conditional information. So that way, when we sample from our distribution, it's going to be a conditional distribution, which is specific to the image which is being presented at that moment. So how do we train this? We're going to use, again, very, um, UCF 101, sort of messy YouTube videos. We're going to use improved dense trajectories to track pixels in our videos. And then that's going to give us our labels, and we're going to train this. And so here's just some initial qualitative results. So we have an image here of a skier. And what this is is that we take tons of samples. We cluster them. We then report the clusters by cluster size to give us a rough understanding of the probability distribution. So the neural network believes sort of that this skier is probably just going to move largely left to the right. So like the highest, you know, the fifth cluster is sort of the crummiest cluster in the, the first. I'll play that again. So the first cluster is the, the most confident cluster. The second cluster is the second most confident cluster. You can think of it that way as well. And, and so basically, it's largely left to right motions where uh, what this believes this here is just going to move left to right. However, based on the context of the scene, different parts might move. And there may be a higher ambiguity in terms of what's, how it's going to move. So this arm, so in this scene, the whole body is not going to move. But this arm is mostly going to move. And it's going to be or the head. <laughs> and the, the, the ambiguity of direction is going to be higher. So in this sense, in this particular action, the, the ambiguity of where things are supposed to move is higher. And the neural network is able to capture that in, based on the contextual cues. So uh, here's another swinger. This is just basically just demonstrates that different just different uh, samples could also be specific to different objects. So we have mostly things focusing on this woman and this girl, and there's another cluster that, that actually focuses on, on, the, on the guy moving as well. So what are these latent variables representing? We also did a qualitative experiment trying to explore how, wh what do these latent variables represent. And the way we do this, we use an interpolation experiment where we have on this side, we have one set of latent variables. The same set of latent variables are, are applied across different images. And then on the other side, we have another set, another point in our latent variable space. 
And we're going to linearly interpolate between these two latent variables to sort of understand qualitatively what's going on. And it's very simple. It's fairly simple here. It appears that these latent variables are largely encoding direction. However, based on the context of the image, that motion direction may be magnified or heavily modulated. So for instance, in the skier example, so for all these, there's a general uh, tendency from left to right. However, with the skier example, this is heavily amplified. So these left and right motions are, are much stronger. However, for this woman in the gym who's doing squat exercises, the bias is heavily towards moving up. And there's only a slight, a slight uh, variation between left and right. And the other two, uh, the other two scenes, there's sort of, it's sort of in between. So we're just sort of demonstrating here that basically the context of the image is heavily conditioning what can actually happen in the image. How do we evaluate this? So here's some qualitative results. What about some quantitative, some numbers? Well, how do we evaluate this? Because this is not necessarily a, 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 a simple thing either. We just simply can't say, oh, this is this. You know, given an image, there may be multiple different reasonable outcomes. And our ground truth might give us a single outcome, which is correct, but it's not the only one. So how do, how do we evaluate this? What we're going to do, we're going to have sort of two approaches, two metrics. The first is negative log likelihood. So we're going to take a lot of samples from a variational autocoder, use a kernel density function to estimate a probability distribution, and look at the probability of the ground truth under that probability distribution. Another way, which is a bit maybe more intuitive, is Euclidean distance, but with a twist. What we're going to do is we want to say, so we have our algorithm that can generate uh, samples, and we're going to say we're going to give you only like 10 chances to generate things, and we're going to look at the closest, the error of the closest sample to the ground truth, and we want to see how that error decreases as the number of chances or number of samples increases. And we're going to compare that uh, with our model against the baselines. So that's sort of the second way to evaluate this quantitatively. We also did a representation learning experiment. So all we did was train a model to basically just forecast pixel motion in videos. But that actually, as I said before, that actually has to build upon a lot of other things. You have to identify what pieces of the object or what object is supposed to move based on what's going on in the image. right? So it has to learn sort of an implicit representation to do this. And could that representation be applied to other vision tasks? So we took our trained neural network and we applied it to Pascal object detection to see what happens. So what we find is sort of interesting here. So uh, we, we compared it to other unsupervised methods of representation learning. And over all general object classes, it doesn't, you know, it, it does okay, but it doesn't do great. But it actually outperforms all the baselines on a very specific object class, and that is detecting humans. Which is actually fairly not surprising, considering that in these videos, most of the moving things are not things like waterfalls or horses or, or cows, they're humans. So it was learning a representation specifically for detecting the moving and active elements in images. OK, so this is nice. We can forecast and, and model pixel motion in images in a data-driven way. But this is, of course, limited for a variety of reasons. The first is, I guess, from an aesthetic standpoint, it's still sort of blurry. Another issue is that all you really can do is sort of identify and, and move existing pixels around. You can't really model things like the appearance of new objects. You can't model things like occlusions. You can't model things like the, the changes in the geometric configurations of objects. So how could we move beyond this? And you could sort of think about another approach to forecasting where you have an image and it's in a state space and you want to forecast the future state of the image. The problem with doing this directly with pixels is that that's really difficult to do. Because if you ever train a model in pixel space, it's a very high dimensional space and you're basically going to force it to model all these concepts at once. Not only model, like identify what objects are there, but also model the geometric configuration of objects, as well as 
things like lower level things like texture and shading and color, which may not actually be that necessary depending on what you want. So what about another idea? What about instead of using pixels as your state space, you use some type of structured space, some type of intermediate representation, something like, like um, pose or bounding boxes or, or semantic masks. And so I'm going to talk about sort of two ideas under this umbrella where we use things like mid-level patches as our, mid as our state space representation as well as human pose. So that's going to move to sort of the third step, using mid-level patches for forecasting. Now I want to emphasize that this is actually somewhat sort of, a, sort of an older paper where um, this is sort of before um, or as um, neural networks were sort of taking over vision. And this is sort of based on more classical vision approaches. But it still sort of points to the high level idea of how could you use an intermediate representation for data driven forecasting. So the idea is we, wanna, we have a scene like this. We want to forecast what happens in the scene, trying to forecast in the space of direct pixels or, or even gradients may be really difficult because it's really hard. So what are we going to do? What we want to do is we can think about an image as a collection of mid-level elements. So the state of this image, you can think of it as sort of a configuration of particular object parts. Or, or entire objects. And what we're going to do is we're, gonna, we're going to use detectors to detect, <coughs> excuse me. What we're going to do is we're going to um, not pre-specify what these object parts are going to be, but we're going to try to discover them in a data-driven way from unlabeled data. So in our case, we're going to use videos from a specific domain. Cop, uh, cop car chases, and then we're going to apply a descriptive technique. This is by Saurabh Singh in 2012, where we're going to discover specifically hog, little hog detectors that represent either objects or pieces of objects. And these little hog detectors are basically going to be specifically the ones of visual elements which distinguish this domain of data, which are like cop car chases, from the rest of the visual world. So this, this process is going to obviously detect things like cars from different positions, as well as other things like trees and street pavement markings. And so these little hog detectors are going to give us a state space, which we can, which we can then plan and, and manipulate to understand how the future might proceed in an image. So for instance, given the state here of a hog patch, we can plan out not only how this hog patch might move on top of the image plane, a distribution of motions, but also a distribution over how this hog patch might change into other hog patches, which represent a sort of a change in pose or, or change in appearance. So basically, you can think of this as sort of planning out in a joint state space of location and appearance. So how do we do this? How are we going to train this model? What we're going to do is that we're going to have hog patches. We're just going to train not only how they might move over the image plane, but also how they might transition to other hog patches and sort of learn a sort of simple Markovian or, or discrete transition model for each of our detectors. So we have detectors here on the left. And here what you see is sort of a ranking based on probability of the most likely transitions. So basically what we're, what we're basically seeing here is we have, we have hog detectors, and then they're like, most likely to transition into other hog detectors, which look similar, but like slightly change in poses, as well as, as well as directions on the image plane specified with the arrows. And so we have this, and we also combine it. I'm going to go, this, go through this really quickly. We, we combine it, this transition model, with a simple nearest neighbor based texture um, it's scene interaction model, which gives us, in it, so in addition to our transition model for our hog patches, we also have an interaction model, which basically says, given a hog patch like this, here are the regions which it can sort of move upon. So warm regions are high likelihoods. Cool regions are, are low likelihoods. 
And what we can do, so this is just a, a demonstration of how you get that. It's just texture nearest neighbor. So we have a reward map, we have a transition model, and what we can just do is we can then plan out transitions which maximize um, reward or, or affordances. And we can do this over the whole image plane. So here are some qualitative results. <clears throat> here we just have an understanding that this car is going to move forward, avoid this bus, and change roughly in, in pose. Here's another example where we have a car moving down this sort of this squiggly road here. There's distributions of trajectories, and then we have one trajectory of it sort of moving around this road. How do we evaluate this quantitatively? Now this was sort of, this was sort of a very um, constrained domain, so what we did is that we just, we hand labeled <coughs> the pixel tracks in, an, in our ground truth data on the image, and then we compare the Euclidean distance of the actual car trajectory with the, basically the top five or top ten trajectories generated by our model. I also want to emphasize as well that this is not just about cars. We also demonstrated that this could be applied to other domains as well. So we took our framework and we applied it to the Virat data set, which is just uh, videos of, of pedestrians walking out in outdoor scenes. And in this case, it just didn't discover that cars were the moving things, but people were. And it had its own interaction model where we forecast where people walk around cars as well as on sidewalks. So, did yes. This is sort of before yeah. the neural networks. Yeah. So this is actually a fairly older paper. Okay. And so the idea here is that you could, you could sort of take some of these ideas and upgrade them to, to neural networks as well. This is sort of like how could you, you, how could you plan in a state space without doing it directly in pixels? You could use some type of intermediate representation for your planning as well. Yeah. Yes. Right, so in this case, this is, we're just making the assumption of one thing moving in isolation. We did not have multi-agent, yeah, yeah. multi which is sort of a, a step beyond this paper. Okay. Yeah. So as, as you said before, you know, this is an interesting idea, but you know, what happens if we sort of explored similar ideas using the power of neural networks, deep learning, and that moves into sort of the fourth, sort of the fourth paper. In this case, instead of using mid-level patches, we're actually going to use human pose as our intermediate representation. So what we're going to do, instead of trying to forecast videos on the lower level of pixels, we're going to think about sort of the higher level idea of we're going to just model humans as our, as our moving things. We're going to forecast how our humans are going to move on a geometric level, just the human skeleton, and then we're going to use that skeleton as structure for generating the lower level details, or filling in the lower level details. So you can think of this or sort of like a, a hierarchical model, where when, we, when we're forecasting something, we first forecast it on so the geometric or spatial level, and then conditioned on that, we, we fill in the lower level details of sort of painting in the colors and the textures. And what's the motivation behind this? Why, why human pose? And the reason is that when we think about videos of, of activities in the vision community, a lot of times we're thinking about specifically of humans doing things. There aren't a lot of videos out there which focus on like forecasts or focus on understanding like waterfalls or cows moving around. The majority of it is really just about humans. So could we make just the simple assumption that humans are the active elements in our images and scenes, and then we can just sort of forecast that as the element of change. The other thing is that while human pose detection is not necessarily a solved problem, it is working well enough that we could almost use it as sort of a free signal in video. So we could take like YouTube videos off the internet, fire a human pose detector on them, and then use that as our labeling. And we can, we can get some pretty decent labeling. So here are some admittedly crummy quality YouTube videos from, from the UCF 101 
And this is, these are just the results of firing a convolutional pose machine on them and doing a little bit of smoothing. So you can get a pretty decent result just by, just by doing that. No, no uh, tracking or, or temporal, modding, temporal mod modeling needed, really. So how are we going to use this free signal to forecast video? This is what we're going to do. We are going to combine the power of variational autoencoders with, uh, with generative adversarial networks to do a complete uh, image or video to video forecasting. So what we're going to do is we're going to have an input clip. We're going to have a model, a, a sort of recurrent variational autoencoder, which is going to forecast the way the human skeleton is going to move in the scene based on what's going on in the scene. And then after we've been able to sort of generate or sample a future skeleton video, we're going to look at the last image we saw with the future, sort of the future way the skeleton is moving. And we're going to use a generative adversarial network to forecast the low-level details and fill in the pixels. So I'm going to go into the details of each approach. So this is sort of a two-step approach, high level to low level. So on the high level, what we want to do is forecast a skeleton. And what we're going to do is, like, given our poses, we're going to have an LSTM combined with a variational wild encoder. So you can think of this as sort of a stochastic LSTM. At every time step, it works very similarly to the pixel trajectory paper, where we have we're conditioned on the history you had before and the current pose. We're going to take samples and sample the different ways this human skeleton can, can move over the next time step. We're going to take a sample and just do it again. And this way, we can sort of sequentially sample different ways the skeleton can move in the future based on what it has seen in the past. And we're just going to train this sort of like just a recurrent variation autoencoder, a variation autoencoder combined with an LSTM. Yes? Yes. So I, I think another just an implementation detail is that we're actually forecasting the trajectory of pose, not the pose itself. It's actually we find empirically, and other people have found this as well, is that when you want to train sort of a motion of a pose, it's much easier to actually ch forecast the change rather than the actual x y location itself. So what's literally going on here is that you have a current pose, you forecast the motion. You, you, you change the skeleton according to that motion, you just do it again. So we're, we're, we're forecasting the change, the, the differential in motion, in, in pose. So you're predicting at each time step a future delta pose? Yes. Um, and your input is your previous pose, as well as? I your input is the pose that is up to that time step. The pose at that time? Yeah, yeah. So like you have a delta pose, and then your new pose is the old pose plus your delta pose. Yeah. So we can forecast skeleton motions. And then what we can do then is use these skeleton motions to fill in the low level details. What we're going to do is we're going to have a video uh, generative adversarial network like this. We're going to have the last image we saw in our input clip plus superimposed on this sort of a moving skeleton of the future motion of the human. And we're going to have a generator that's going to combine this information to generate a video on the pixel level. And we're going to train this in sort of the common adversarial method, adversarial way, where we have a generator that's going to generate fake videos, and we have real videos. We're not going to just generate our fake videos from nothing. We're going to generate them conditioned on an image and a moving skeleton. And we're going to have a discriminator that is going to try to distinguish which are the reals from the fakes. And the generator is going to win when it, when it tricks the discriminator. And the discriminator is going to win when it can discriminate between the fakes and the real videos. So here are some qualitative results. So here on the left here, you have an input clip. Here on the right, you have basically a sample or, or basically a mode of the most likely uh, future motion. So we have some like a tennis player here sort of walking forward. We have someone uh, basically making a pizza. 
moving around their arms. We have sort of a completion of a pull-up. So the input clip just has this person pulling up, but the forecast has them completing the pull-up and moving back down. So we emphasize here it's not just extrapolating based on previous velocities. It is actually able to model something more complex, sort of nonlinear motions based on the context. And then what we can do is we can leverage this information to fill in the details with pixels. So we can leverage the moving skeletons um, to, to fill, in, fill that in and, and fill in the pixels. So it's able to do some rough in-painting here. Um, yeah, so what we're, this is just sort of demonstrating you can use the structure to do this. So how do we evaluate this? We can evaluate on the pose level fairly easy using previous techniques like Euclidean distance. Uh, so this is very similar to the way we evaluate the pixel trajectories. So we can do that. But how can we evaluate it on the pixel level? How can we do so without resorting to things like crowdsourcing? How can we, understand, how can we get a computer to basically say, this video looks more real than another video? And what we did is that we used two metrics. We used inception score, which is borrowed from the generative adversarial community. And we used also an MMD metric. So the way the inception score works, it works on this intuition. We're going to assume that we have a third party classifier, which classifies semantic elements in our videos. And what we're going to do is this. We're going to make the assumption that if your generator is generating crummy things, then if you fire a classifier on it, it's not going to identify anything of, of, of value. And so the outputs of the semantic labels that come from this classifier are going to be very close to the prior distribution of labels on average. It's not going to find anything very distinctive that it identifies very well. However, if you have imagery which looks fairly real, then if you fire a classifier on this, then a classifier is going to pick out specific things it can identify very well in its imagery. And the posterior of your labels, given your data, is going to be pretty far away from your prior. And so we're basically going to try to maximize this distance as much as we can. So the higher this number, the, the better uh, your, your videos or images look. And then MMD metric is sort of a similar, is sort of a similar idea. We have a third party classifier. You're going to extract semantic features from your third party classifier. But instead of thinking about uh, label distributions, we're going to think about just an error metric where how far away is the distribution of your semantic labels in your real videos versus the fake videos. So the smaller this, this metric is, the better. And so we did this quantitative evaluation. We compared it against the baseline. 47 here is actually Carl Vondrick's Scene Dynamics paper from NIPS 2016. It's basically a video GAN based on no structure at all. So if, what happens if you try to train a model not using any human pose at all, but, but trying to generate everything from scratch, trying to generate the, the pixels trained only on the pixels. And what we see here quantitatively is that our results, our, our, our model using the additional structure of skeletons is able to outperform this dramatically. So that concludes sort of the prior work. This is what I worked on at Carnegie Mellon. What would be some of the future directions for forecasting, as well as just more general ideas? So we could take some of these ideas and apply them to sort of situations where you need real-time interaction with the environment. You know, if, if you're trying to understand videos not only um, after the fact, after something has happened, but specifically as it's happening or before it happens, like for instance, what, what am I doing, what am I doing, what am I doing, you know, I could do this and you can, you can say, okay, we've identified the, that I've picked up a cup or you know, just by doing this, can we get a computer to understand I'm just about to pick up a cup? Um, and you can apply this to different contexts. Another idea is sort of the idea of uh, not just robotic planning, but planning and decision making in general for computers. Um, if you're in a visual environment and you're an agent and you can make decisions and you're trying to reach goals, can we apply some of these ideas to understand the consequences of your actions? So. If I'm in the, in the world and I, and, I, and I mess with objects, how are, they going to, how are they going to change in pose and configuration? And how could that help me um, achieve my goals, whether I'm a physical robot in the real world or I'm in a video game? If I apply controls, how does that change my environment 
and how does that help me plan when things dynamically change, whether that's me or other things in my world. Another concrete application is anomaly detection. So we can think of, if we use these sort of, sort of these, these models to forecast things, and then if things happen which differ from what you forecast, then that is sort of a definition of an anomaly. And finally, since this is sort of a data-driven approach, trying to forecast frames and videos, we could apply some of these ideas to representation learning. Um, how could a forecasting model help other, other approaches and visions, such as detection or, or classification? So that concludes my talk. Thanks a lot. <laughs>